Okay. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. I've been here a couple of days before this to settle down and have a look around uh, Kiev. Lots of interesting stuff, and I've got a lot more interesting stuff to look at tomorrow, and I'm not flying back till Monday, so I'm making the most of this journey. So I think the most important thing that I found is that people are just absolutely fabulous. Uh, so that's great. The welcome, um, people are talking, and, and it's great. There is a different, I go to a lot of these conferences, there is a different feel at, at this conference. It's extremely friendly, um, and people are freely sharing ideas, so it's great. One other thing that I have observed at this conference, which I haven't seen, and I, I go to a lot of lean and agile conferences, is the mix of people, and I mean in, in, in gender in here. Okay, I think it's about 50-50 male-female. Um, I wish it was like that everywhere that I spoke. But unfortunately, predominantly, it's old males that fill the audience. But here, you're all young males, you're young females. It's brilliant. So the, the energy and the vitality that's here in this movement is fabulous. The other thing that is fabulous, I just want to talk about the people that organize this. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a really um, a pleasure coming here. Everything was meticulously planned. So a round of applause, please, for the organizers, because they do a fabulous job in making our lives easy. <clears throat> OK, enough of the introductions. I've got so much that I want to talk about. I don't think I'm going to fit it all in. I had a choice last night. I was speaking to a couple of guys and some other people at the, um, at, at the banquet yesterday, which was, which was really great. Uh, we got to lot, know a lot of people. So I, after that conversation, I came back and I changed my presentation. And the reason I did that is because, I, yes, there's a lot of theory in the work that I do. There's a lot of research, and it's important that we know that. But also, there's also the practical side. So I put a lot more practical stuff into the second half of, of my presentation. So the first half of my presentation is really bringing to you some science about what we call a work climate. What it's like to work in a lean and agile environment, in good, in superior even, climates. And what the, the science tells us about the long-term profitability of that. And it's really important that, that you understand that and when you talk to your colleagues and your managers back home. It makes perfect sense to work this way, not just for commercial gain, which is important, but for the well-being of the people that work in those organizations. And this is what this presentation fundamentally is about. It's about human well-being, contribution, willing contribution, <laughs> engagement, freedom. And this is really what's at the heart of lean and agile. Methods may come and go, but the principles for engaging the willing contribution, the ingenuity, and the creative use of people, they are timeless. They're timeless. Remember, agile will subsume to something else, but never forget the principles for engaging people, because that's what makes this stuff work. And I want to prove it to you right now. On the screen, you see something that I call a climate. And I'm going to explain a lot of this stuff. These are words that we talk about being at work. It's, you know, we're sharing information with people. Performance and measurement is, is, is fair. And it's making us focus on the right things. We understand what we're trying to do for our customers. I understand not just my part in the organization, but what everybody else does as well. So I have this great knowledge about the whole organization. You know how to respond well to customers. It's respectful. Lots of collaboration. It's also challenging because we're on the edge of invention and creativity. That's why it's challenging. And also, you've got the freedom and the decision making in there. And sometimes you need the leadership and the courage. That's an environment in which Lean and agile principles, when you apply those to, you get this type of environment. Okay? You get the behavior you design for. So I'll be talking a lot about this, but there's a word right at the middle of this. This trustworthiness. <clears throat> and this works both ways. It works on the management teams being trustworthy. 
If there's a history of them not being trustworthy, then trying to go lean or agile is going to be difficult for them. So they're going to have to clean up their past. Okay? And I will talk about some methods for cleaning up that past today. It's really hard conversations about how things went wrong in the past, how trust was lost. Okay? So management for lean and agile to work must first become trustworthy. And when I'm called in to look at an organization, they say, we want this agile stuff, we want this lean stuff. The first question I say is, are you trustworthy? And they look at me a little, and then I dig a deep, bit deeper, and then I found no. When times got extremely tough, they laid people off, they treat, treat, treated them badly, okay? They outsourced a bit without telling anybody. So you lose trust. So I tell them before they go anywhere near lean or agile to clean up their act first because their staff are going to call them on it. Because that's what lean and agile does. It allows you to call out people's bad behavior that doesn't contribute to the well-being and the creativity of staff. Slide set are up on the slide share right now. Um, this is the set. I finished it at 2.30 this morning. You may find there's some typos in there. That's because I was tired. <clears throat> I got a blog on Lloyd Parry. Um, please take a look at that. Um, I've been blogging about this event on there, and at, at the end, there's some more blogs going on. So there's a couple of articles that I've written specifically for this talk. Okay. Before I go any further, um, there is an acknowledgement right at the end of lots of people um, that I've worked with, and a lot of the sources are in the end uh, slide. But I've got to bring out this guy, first of all, this guy, Gary Fisher. Um, I met him back in, in the year 2000, uh, and he was working for the London School of Economics. He went on to work at Aston Business School, and he's now at Warwick University. He works in the, in the area of work psychology how to measure the way that people within organizations think, their perceptions. And I came across him in 2000 after he saw a documentary that the BBC had completed on, on my work at Fujitsu. And he called me up and he says, can, can I come and have a look at um, how you're creating this type of change? And I said, sure enough. So he came along and he ran a lot of diagnostic tests, lots of questioning came back to me when I was at Fujitsu and said, look, in this area, there's a lot more autonomy. This is great. Over here, it's a little bit in between, and over here, there's nothing at all. So my guess, Gary said, is you haven't started over here. You've just started here, and you started first over here. And I said, you're absolutely right. But he said once, and I said, well, how do you know that? And he says, it's, it's in my measurement system. We are measuring these behaviors and perceptions. And he said something very interesting. He said, there is the profile, the psychological profile that's being created through the introduction of Lean and Agile at that time was very similar to the profile that researchers in the United States 30 years ago had said, if your organization has this type of psychological profile, it's a very strong, and in statistical terms, that means it's certain, to lead to long-term profitability. But then Gary said to me, there's one thing wrong with that research. While it says you can create that sort of climate and psychological profile, the research doesn't tell you what you have to do to get it. And we'd like to work with you to find out what you are doing that gives rise to this profile. Now, if you're living in the lean and agile world, you'll, you'll recognize the profile straight away when I bring it up here. So it's of no, it's of no mystery to us. And I said, well, do I really need to have a lot more psychological profiling? And uh, he said, no, you don't need to. I said, look, I know that's what I'm trying to do. And then he said something. He said, I know, Stephen, you're trying to create that sort of profile. He said, but I can prove it, Gary said to me. And I said, okay, we need to talk. That led to another 12 years to develop a lot of the things that you're going to see today. So it's scientifically rigorous, um, and I'm going to give you a summary of some of that. So this guy is really important in kicking that work off. So I'm getting into the presentation 
really gently now. So what are we trying to do? Really, we're trying to get the organization out of the way of people in order pe for people to do good work. And that's harder than you think. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to give choice freedom the power to do, in this case, what matters to the customer. If we can get our employees that have choice freedom and the power to do, then we can do good work. Get in the organization out of the way of people. But there are things that we've got to focus on. Leadership, our performance measures, processes, and the methods we use, the, the very design of the job, and what the climate, as we said. All of those have their impact on this. <clears throat> and there are basically two types of organizations I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> We heard a little bit about it, about the industrial model or the mass production. And I'm going to compare the industrial model to the lean and agile model. All of these constraints, when badly designed, just stifle creativity. And especially if you've got a fear and a blame culture, then there is no chance for creativity. You can't command and control somebody to be innovative. It's not. That's not the right environment. So how do we change that? That's what I want to talk about now. We want to create something that enables these things. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about the climate in a moment, visualization and measurement. Then, how do we get the willing contribution and trust in the business? Being true about the purpose, what are we really trying to do as a team, as an organization? Clarity of purpose is absolutely supreme. And then leadership without position. Leadership is an activity, not a position. And anybody can lead. I'm going to ask you now to put your hands up. If you're involved in developing or training either your colleagues or other people. We'll put your hand up if you're involved in developing or training other people. Okay, that's the vast majority. Then that makes you a change leader. You don't need the position power. And in all the changes that I've worked in since uh, 1995, it is the people that do the work and just above that creates the transformation. If you'll enable those people they will create possibilities for the organizations you can't imagine. But it takes a brave management team to allow that. But if they are not brave, you have to help them be brave. So you have to lead them to that, and I'll talk about that shortly. Okay, I would like to turn the lights down just a bit. We can turn them down, not off, because it'll be chaos if they're off. That's perfect. So, <clears throat> um, some of you might have seen this before. If you have, please don't say anything to your colleagues. I'd like four volunteers to come up on the stage. There is a warning here. This is not ritual humiliation time, okay? So it's painless. Um, so I'd just like four people, first four people to stand up and come here. First four people on the stage. Okay, I got two here, one there, and yeah, okay. It looks like I might have five. That's okay. All right. <clears throat> and now what I would like to do is I would like four or five people right at the back, probably within the vicinity of that clock, to just stand up. And you, Ben, as well. We've got the great Ben here, by the way. Okay, please, just stand up in the vicinity and go as far back towards that clock as you can. I need five, at least five people up there, please. Okay, just stand up there. That's it. Just another, another one or two. Yeah, okay. He's a bit shy. Okay, all right. Cool, all right, great. Now, what I would like you to do is to go back to the, to the, back to the stage as, as, as far as you can. What I'm going to do right now is I'm only going to be to working with the group at the back and the, the group on the stage. You guys, I want you to just stay quiet for a moment. I'll come back to you in a moment. What I will be doing is, in a moment, I will be putting a very famous uh, a picture of a very famous person. And all I want you to do, please stay quiet, all right, is identify that person. I would like you to look at this person 
and you, you five, and then talk between you really quietly and come to an agreement on who this person is. Will you do that for me? Yes? All right. And I'd like you to do the same, but you're going to be very close. But I don't want you to stand in front of the picture. The picture is going to go here. All right? And I want you to just stand just a bit here and look at the picture that's going to come on the wall. Just, just stand here like I am, just ready to look. Okay? The picture will be on the screen for 15 seconds, and then I'll take it off. No talking except within the teams. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, turn around, look at the screen. Turn around, look at the screen. Okay. Let's move to the side. So who is, who is the person? Who is the person? Come to some agreement. Okay. Just confer. No, you can't see my at all. You can't see it. No, it's where you stand. I know this optical illusion. Yes. It's not an optical illusion either. That's the thing. Okay. And who do you see? Who do you see? Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. Okay. All right, then. <clears throat> we do have some consensus. One of this team has seen this before. So I'm going to discount you for a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you guys at the front, who do you see? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Who do you see? Mar Marilyn Monroe. Okay. So who do you guys see in here? Ma hands up if you see Marilyn Monroe. Hands up if you see Einstein. This is the next question. Hands up if you see both. Yeah? Okay. So can you at the back come here and you swap places really quickly, please? This is quite a famous picture, but I want to use it as a metaphor for lean and agile companies in a moment. Okay, so let's put this up. Okay. Now, when you're at the two extremes, you can only see the one image. In between, it's a bit blurry. You might see Marilyn Monroe with a moustache. Okay. So, what am I trying to do with this? Really, the way I use this, this picture is designed that you see what you see is dependent on your distance from the picture. It is not an optical illusion. Okay. It is, it is the patterning that comes out with distance. It's computer generated. It's a new technology, and you're going to see it in a lot of adverts. As you're walking down the street towards a bus shelter, there's an advert, and suddenly it'll change in front of your eyes. Okay? And most of you will think you are going mad, and you'll be running up and down the street. So, how do I use this? Okay. I'd like you to sit down now. You can sit down and be comfortable. So, a big round of applause for everybody for doing that. Thank you very much. There, there's two ways I use this. If you imagine this is the frontline staff, they can see some of the things are not as new and working as well as they used to. It's a bit old, it's scraggy. That's where frontline staff work. Up there are the management. They think their operation looks like Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> All right? And you guys in the middle are the middle managers who have to deal with these two perceptions. So you're in the middle, you know that it's something we come down and talk to the frontline staff and say, yeah, it's bad. And then you go up there and you think, oh, I've got to change these reports to make it look like Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> because I need them to stay up there. Because if they come down here, there's going to be mayhem. So use it for a hierarchy. I also use it for end-to-end -end business particularly in 
in development and IT. The development guys are one end, all right? See in Marilyn Monroe. The IT guys that are managing the infrastructure and all the bugs and the systems that are coming down and all the customer pain that comes from that, they're on the other end. That's the Einstein end. So we have two dimensions. The beginning of the value stream at the end, totally different views. From the organization at the top to the front, totally different views. How on earth can we come to some consensus and purpose on what we need to fix? Without clarity of purpose, we get politics. Without clarity of purpose, we get bad customer responses. We lose trust. So getting that vision, that single vision, is really important. It is no wonder that Agile, Lean, Kanban, Scrum, and all these other things are big on visual management. At least, at least see the same picture. Really, really important. If you're all seeing a very different picture of reality, things can go mightily wrong. So, we're now leading into the climate. Like, what is the climate? It's the thinking, feelings, and perceptions of the staff and the managers. All right? Climate is like the weather. All right? Climate works across a large area like Europe, but maybe in Spain it's slightly different to in the Ukraine. Okay? So, Ukraine is warm. I remember in a conversation. Ukraine is warm and Spain, it may be cold. But the temperature for Europe is a particular temperature. And we can drill down into that. But the other thing with climate, it works at different levels of the organization. The higher up you go, or above the clouds, it's sunshine. But if you're below the, the clouds, you may be getting rained on or worse. So what we are doing with this is we are looking at the psychological climate within the organization. And this is what this is about. So this is a climate. It can be <clears throat> a good climate, okay? Or it could be a toxic climate. Really bad. Don't do anything. It's none of those words. Trustworthy, phew. the only thing you can trust is being beaten out. But actually getting a really nice climate leads to great work, and the science proves that. But what does it mean to have a nice climate? Let's dig a little deeper. There are four dimensions that Gary and I were able to pull out of 160. To really make it accessible, so that we can go out and understand what we're looking for. When I go into organizations, I look for these characteristics. I look for how well the organization engages with its customers and deeply understands. And who is doing it? Is it just a single product manager? That's the, that's the worst thing I've seen in Agile. All right? Product management is just a crazy way of doing things, because that's a single point of failure. Uh, it doesn't engage the whole team in understanding the customer's environment. How do we take that understanding and learn from it and share it across the organization? And then how do we make decisions about it? What sort of choices? And who makes those decisions? Is it the guys at the top or is it the local teams? About the products, the services themselves, the designs. And then how do we improve and change? This is what I call the learning cycle of an adaptive organization. As the outside organization changes, so much the organization inside. And to do that, this is the cycle at an organizational level. Let me tell you a bit more. Engaging. Let's bring it up alive. And I'm going to characterize the industrial model with the agile model. Okay? The industrial model is in red. Does the job design allow all staff to engage with customers and users of the service? Or they, you're in the back room, you're not even allowed to talk to them. Or, you know, is everything forbidden unless it's permitted? You can't do anything unless you ask first. Or is it everything is permitted unless it's forbidden? And what I mean by that, you can do anything you like, but actually over here, there's this legal compliance with SOX compliance. We have to do that. So we have to do that. But everything else is open for improvement. 
So that's engaging. Learning and sharing with the rest of the business. Do staff routinely share information about what's happening in the customer's world and the business world? I mean, ordinary staff like you and who you train with senior management. Do they sit down and talk about those issues? Or do they, do they routinely collaborate and problem solve with the senior and mid, mid managers? Do the senior managers problem solve? Very few do. More so in the software industry, because they've usually grown up from that background. But that's an anomaly in the great world of work out there. What is the management focus? Employee utilization, cost reduction, and work intensification. That's what they're judging you on. That's what the reward and recognition system would look at. Or is it, I am focusing on increasing the creativity of my staff. I'm looking at the customer outcomes that my staff create as a team. They're solving problems routinely. That's what I pay them for. They're, so, they're learning and sharing this knowledge. And we have collaboration. Collaboration is not just putting um, an end-to-end -end team in a room and expecting them to come up with things. Collaboration means when a colleague is in trouble in a different department, you lend your resources even when you know it's going to hurt you. That's the level of collaboration I'm talking about. Where people genuinely share the resources and no, they don't ask permission from the managers to do it. Leading. Who does the leading? Do leaders foster this no-blame climate to surface problems? I want to see all the problems. Usually, no, we keep them hidden. Do leaders pay attention to the efficiency-driven targets or end-to-end -end effectiveness? Again, who does the leading? Do we exchange opinions without any facts, usually position power, or do we exchange facts supported with evidence? Evidence it has no respect for hierarchy. Just remember that. And if there's a rule that I say to everybody that I take through my training stuff is, don't be afraid. Go in armed as if you're going to have a fight, and you won't have a fight. What do I mean by that? Always talk from the customer's perspective. Your customer is your shield. And your data is your sword. And it takes a mighty brave chief executive to overcome somebody who's saying, this is what's happening to our customer. And this is the data that backs up how we are doing that and what we need to do about it. It takes a very brave CEO or any other manager to say, I don't care about that. So link the two. Don't try to fight your corner. Don't try to take away your pain. Position it as whatever's happening in your department and its impact to the customer. You should do that anyway. Every single job, including the chief exec, needs to have a clear line of sight with every activity they do with customer value. If they don't, then they have no way of knowing what they're doing is effective or not. Go and talk to HR department. Is there a clear line of sight between HR and how it satisfies your customers? They'll say things like, oh, it'll all work out in the end, which means they don't know. But that goes for all of us in organizations. OK, improving. Do you influence the end-to-end -end business process? Are you allowed to change the measurement system? In an adaptive, agile, lean organization, you should be routinely changing your measurement system on how you produce value. Because the value is constantly changing. This is not the same as targets and goals. All right, the targets and goals, say, for profit and all those, those are important. But in terms of value, those value measurements are going to be in a constant state of change. Why? I'm engaging and deeply understanding, and this is what matters to my customer, and that's no I now need to measure. How does everything end-to-end -end meet that? And putting those measurements in the hands of your staff will have a transformative effect you cannot believe. And it also enables people to make decisions lower down. So I'm going to show you the science. The way that we run the science is it's an online questionnaire. There are about 16 different questions. Um, there are four questions in every one of those areas of engaging, learning, leading, and improving. 
about free, how much freedom of decision making, how involved with the customer, do you understand what's going on in the customer's world, do you share that with the team, how much organizational understanding do you have, do you, do you share across your function, do you cross other functions with senior management. Information is the lifeblood of lean, agile, and adaptive organizations. But we keep it in the silos. Here, there are no silos for information. Then the performance management. Does that encourage you to do the, the mass production model? You just move whatever widgets or tickets or lines of code. Somebody somewhere will integrate it. Okay. Or is it about that creativity? the adaptive leadership, and responding to issues and implementing ideas. So this is the service. And some of these are quite complex slides. So I want to go through them very slowly. There are two types of organization. The mass production, one size fits all, low variety, skills are low, customer engagement is transaction. Right up to what I call the lean, agile, adaptive, which I've given a name of a, a customer value enterprise. There are some others in between which I will ignore for the, in the interests of time. So I'm going to take those two at the moment, those top two. All right. So in mass production, there's low variety, no customer involvement, employee skills are basic, management focuses utilization, cost reduction, and work intensification, as opposed to creativity, expertise, etc. But I, I compete differently. I compete as being a trusted advisor and expert looking at integration and business outcomes. Here, it's commoditized. I go for high volume and low margins. And the biggest sin of managers who are in the creative industries who work like that, who then say, we need to industrialize it. So they put their workers in a system that they are born and built for that, but they imprison them in this. That's what industrialization does. It just strangles the life. But knowledge work needs air to breathe and a good climate. This is just a summary of those two. Disciplined experimentation as opposed to disciplined compliance. This is all on the, the slide share, so you can take a look at that. On my website, there are some other videos that go into a lot more depth than that. So this is the climate. I'm going to take the first two, engaging learning, and then I'm going to show the, the leading and improving in a moment. But this one is slightly different. This is one company, but it's two teams. And it's two teams in the same country, but at different ends of the country. So they're supposed to be following the same processes. They have somebody auditing, as a clue, whether they're doing Agile correctly, whether they're doing Scrum correctly. All right? And one of the teams doesn't meet the audit, and the other one does. But the strange thing is, is the one that doesn't meet the audit is the one that's performing much higher. So they're mystified until we take a look at the climate. So, this is team one and team two. They are different climates, same organization. All right. There was some good, if you look at, this is towards direct and control industrialization. This is towards lean and agile. This one was a very industrial model. Customer facing activity was high, not much Intelligence gathering, what we need to be is in the middle here or above. Sharing team intelligence, well, that was okay. Then what about learning? Okay, they were sharing within the function. They did some sharing with other functions, but they never saw the management. Never. This team hadn't seen a senior manager in four years. Except on an all-hands video. Okay, this team, however, on the compliance for Agile, and they did some Kanban as well as um, some lean stuff, 
They were different. Customer facing activity, intelligence gathering, and sharing intelligence. Look at their organizational understanding compared to these. Huge. Their networks were massive. They were engaging with other people in the organization. These stayed within their team. Silo thinking gone crazy. Remember, it's not the methods. Sharing intelligence with senior management. So they were breaking the audit rules. Let's look at the leading. Leadership was very weak. They were responding to customer issues when there was failure. But they weren't responding to customer issues when they wanted something new. They'll say, that's not on the support list. You need to go through this process. And customers for that team were actually saying, that, don't give me that team. Yet, the audit was saying they were good. Implementing ideas to better serve customers. Improving. On improving this team, they weren't interested in improving the service, the actual work, other functions, or even the end-to-end -end process compared to their colleagues over here. Implementing ideas to better serve customers, responsiveness to customer issues. They were highly responsive to customer issues when it went wrong. They were responding to new things the customer needed, as well as when it went wrong. Okay, Look what they were improving. They were improving things outside of their team. It is no longer the days of thinking outside the box are long gone. It is time to work outside the box and work in any box at any level you like. With the data, the customer is your shield and your data is your sword. Take it everywhere. Take it to the senior managers. You go and get it done. Or you can have this. And it's largely your choice. Because you can get up and go and talk to another team. That's how easy it is sometimes. But if the climate says, no, you don't go, don't go and talk to Joe in that department. We've got this work here. I know you get this, but listen, I'm hitting my targets. You've got to hit those. This is a large company. It's slightly different. Okay, the other one was um, some agile teams. This was a company of about 1,800. This was a large uh, a global software company. You would know this. I'm not allowed to tell you because it's competitive. But when we did a survey on engaging, learning, leading, and improving, you know the stuff that's in there. It came out predominantly as a mediocre mass production model. And they knew they had a problem. 18 months later, we redesigned the organization so that people could collaborate. We changed the measurement system. We changed the attitude of the people because we changed the work around them. In fact, what we had was a team of 25 people from around the world, engineers, developers, and a whole range of people with one or two managers, not many, certainly no senior managers. And they came in, and in 25 days, they'd redesigned the organization on how it should, should, should look. They presented that to the board, and the board said to the, the, the vice president, layer, do you want this? And the vice president said, if we get that, we can deliver the business, and the people will love it. It's designed by the people for the people to deliver to our customers. We've been screwing it up for too long, and it's not working. So in this company, there are people three layers down from a, a, a VP where that engineer designed that VP's job. Okay, and that, that is the subject of my latest book. Uh, the latest book is called Surviving Organizations. This is where it was 18 months later. Massive transformation. In that time, every single job role changed. And this was a global change. One of the fastest changes ever. Why was that? Because the staff had designed the change. Not only had they designed the change, they'd taken different parts of that design and tested it. What worked? And then worked on the integration. 
come to purpose. Purpose is really, really important. This was a purpose that was put together by the IT uh, guys and the application support guys in a very large city in the UK. It's a public body. And the government was saying things like, we're not getting the most out of IT. So again, they went to the staff and said, what are we doing wrong? And they said, we, well, we will do that for you, but you've got to promise something. And they said, what have you got to promise? You promise that it's going to be a safe environment where we can challenge you and you recognize our contribution because you've never been doing that. But the citizens of this city require that we do it. Our jobs depend on it and the management jobs too. So they went through what I call a trust strategy. Because they put up that statement and said, that's what we want. And they said to the management team, that's what we want, and can you commit to that, because we will deliver. We still don't know what it's going to look like, but do that, we'll figure it out. That's the power of purpose. It reveals the reality, the pretense, and the cost of that to the business, as we will see. To do this, we must be honest, committed, and inspiring. Because they didn't see themselves as that, they certainly didn't see the management team as that. So they were challenging the management to step up. Another way of purpose, uh, this is an exercise. Um, I always look for a common purpose, a purpose that satisfies customers, employees, and the business. One statement that any one of those people can read, and I say I 100% agree with that. Usually a purpose says, um, we deliver first-class services for our customers, and we uh, invest in our people, blah, 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 and we give great shareholder return. That's our purpose, and that's our common purpose. That's not true. You only have, if you're an employee, you only want that little bit where it talks about you. If you're a customer, so that's not a purpose. That's a cascaded down. The only thing that's common is you've all been through the lectures to tell you this is our common purpose. Okay, it's usually come from the management team going up the mountain, wrapping a cold towel around their heads, and coming back down with these tablets of stone, with them written on and expecting you to swallow them. This is the work, and this is the work of that same team that designed the organization. And again, it was mostly engineers that were in that room. We said, they, we, need, we were asking them what, because they were, these are enterprise applications. Massive up enterprise application. So from a customer's purpose, they, they would say, strengthen my value chain that helps me differentiate my competitors, provide a return. That's what customer, that's where they were buying that software. The employee, I want to contribute my skills, be fairly rewarded, I want a secure environment. None of this talk about offshoring all the time. Okay. That offers challenges and allows me to develop and grow. From a business, we provide expertise for us to produce, sell, and support software and running and supporting infra infrastructures and applications to do that. So then, what we were then able to do with that, because it took some time to find a statement that meant all of that, we would then say, well, how do we measure that? And then that comes out. What is the value they are trying to create? How do we measure this? A very simple thing on, on processes. One of the things that they put into process measurement is that it makes the lives easier and the employees happy. If the process doesn't do that, you've got to go away and redesign it. Okay. Usually, this is the process, you've got to go and do it. So, you get different measurement systems. You can see how that triggers off a whole host of things. And... This is the statement that they came up with. And every one of those could say that and mean what they... With pride, we relentlessly pursue and apply our insight, ingenuity, and technologies to create wealth and a secure future. Who on that board doesn't agree with that? It's interesting. Thomas Q, we called him, 
when we started working there, she said, you know, we all work for the same company, but we live in different worlds. It's another manifestation of Marilyn Monroe and Albert Einstein again. A serious bit. This is the bit where the staff have to tell the management, it's not Marilyn Monroe, your baby is ugly. That's a really hard moment. What we have on here is the chief architect um, with another team of people. This was the, the city that I was talking about just now that wanted them to be honest. So this is how we arrived at the truth strategy, what we were going to do to gain forgiveness, mend our ways, but knowing that we are going to fall back sometimes with some forgiveness in that too. What they did was to give a very real view about all the problems, all the issues. They're on here, it, and it, it doesn't matter. It, it was things like, um, we actually don't cheat our reports, we just make them look better. We remove the anomalies. All right, again, the middle management, making it look like Marilyn Monroe, so they never see this, all right? So it comes as a big shock when those guys come up here, all right? Because they couldn't believe it. They said, oh, wow. So they were owning up on how they were fiddling all the figures. I asked them to come up with what they say about themselves as an organization. We invest in our people. We are trustworthy and honest. We are highly responsive to our customers. And you can see, you can't see because it's in, there's a list, and this is going to be terrible for the video, I'm sure. There's a list on this white piece here of all the things they tell themselves. And then, out of 10, from 1 to 10, I asked the question, Rating out of 1 to 10, we invest in our people. How, how strongly do we say that? We say that. 9 out of 10. There it is. What's the reality? 1 or 2 out of 10. So now we are mapping the pretense and the reality. This is where all trust is lost. This is the inauthenticity gap. You cannot have learning adaptive organizations if there is an inauthentic gap as wide as that. They told the senior managers they were fiddling the reports, that the performance wasn't as good. And they were shocked when the management turned around and said, we know. And they said, well, why didn't you stop us? And they said, it keeps other people away from us too. They were saying things like they had enough resources when they didn't. So when they wanted to have more resources, they couldn't go and ask because they'd lied, they got enough resources. We're always in control, don't worry. Everything's green, our SLAs are all green but massaged. They're what we call watermelon measures. Green, on the outside, and red in the inside, okay? But you have to cut it open to see the reality. And this is what this is doing. And it was cutting deep. This is a cleaned up version, the pretense, the reality, and what it costs us. Futile, don't give up my best, disengage, my willing contribution, you ain't gonna get it. Loss of honesty, integrity, customer dissatisfaction. And then, after they'd gone through this process in the room, over a day, talking about these things, it was all out on the table. All the cost was there. Then I asked a very simple question. You are pretending you have this authenticity gap, and it's been like that for years. You know, look at the cost, personally. 
And by the way, for, there was another cost for a black cat. That came up. And I said, for the sake of the black cat, oh, you haven't heard the story of the black cat? I thought it was quite famous. The black cat, the people who had loss of honesty, integrity, frustration, one of the engineers went home and said, there's a big cost for my cat. I said, what, like you don't give it cat food? No, no, I give it a kick every time I get home. I'm so frustrated. We said, oh, you can't do that. So for the sake of the black cat, we needed to change something. So I said to them, if that's the cost, what's the benefit? What do you think the benefit is if I'm prepared to go in day in, day out in that toxic work climate, because that's what that is, created by the people themselves, between the management and the staff who put up with it for years. At that cost, what was the benefit? What do you think the benefit? Anybody venture? Put your hand up where the voice is coming from. Yes, along those lines, the biggest cost was I didn't have to take responsibility for anything to improve anything because it might fail and I get beaten up. So I avoided taking responsibility because it was not safe. And that was a bigger benefit than the cost until we outlined the cost and they said, that's too big a cost. The benefit is not worth it. And only then can you move to transformation. Now, this is not agile. This is not lean. This is work psychology in creating an environment of trust. Trustworthiness is the bedrock for effective transformation of any kind, especially lean and agile, because it's totally dependent on the ingenuity and willing contribution of people. So I'm coming towards the end of what I'm talking about. This is a large organization. They've got some, some maps up here. This is from development, right at the far left, right down to, um, to the run down here. And, and these are people from the end-to-end -end business, understanding how they were impacting each other, getting the one view of Einstein in the room. And in order to, to move this company towards a collaboration system, we needed to visualize the work. Those are the four things. You just saw some visualization. We needed to measure the work, not within the silos, but end-to-end -end and customer outcomes. And the staff needed to design and, me and manage those measures. Perfecting the work, that means making sure no errors happen. Or if errors happen, that they get together and figure it out. People just finding out how things are done upstream and downstream improved collaboration no end. Performance went up. And then developing the workforce using A3 techniques. So you saw visualizing. I'll leave that up there so it's on the screen. It's, it's, in, the, it's in, the, in the slide share. That is the scheme for what you see in the background there. The red area were where we wanted to surface problems and work on problems. These meetings were, were, were twice a week, huge cross-functional meetings. They brought the issues and problems that were happening across various interfaces. It was a problem-solving event. It was not about the status, how we hit in this target or wherever. No, it was about what is preventing us being successful. And in this room, senior managers were allowed and encouraged. But once you're in that room, there is no hierarchy. There, this is a blame-free zone. And you're allowed to ask questions. And the sorts of questions that, that would be asked, if you want to take a picture of that, you can. I'll leave that up there for a moment. But it is in the slide set. OK. That's the sort of boards that we were using. Measuring the work end to end. Don't measure any business using averages, please, because it's the range that's important. OK? I, I even put this into, in front of CFOs and CEOs, and, and they vote for the purple company because sometimes we overachieve until I point out, which they mysteriously miss, that sometimes they underachieve. Instead of what we want to do is consistency, consistency, all the way through. 
This is something you can take away quite quickly. I recommend that you do. This is looking at your measurement system. This tells you how your company thinks. Does the measure that you're measuring, whatever it is, your internal measure, does it matter to the customer? No or yes? And some of them you have to measure, they don't matter, but that's okay. But you've got to have some measures that matter to customers. So does it matter to no or yes, the customer? And is it functional, Mean means my, only my department measures that? Or is it end-to-end, -end, which means it's the same measure, literally the same measure, not cost reduction siloed, it's end-to-end -end cost reduction. I, I've got some agile stuff. I don't have time to go through that. I, I quickly put this together this morning. I got the, um, the run space, the ITIL, ITSM. If you don't know what you're I'm talking about there, talk to me afterwards. There's a big movement that says, this is the standard for managing IT, and this is what you should measure. And where were all the measures? Very few matter to the other. I'm not saying these are not important, but these are all to do with resources. And when you turn resource targets for targets for creative staff, the trap is already set. Those are measures for managers, but we devolve them to staff. They, the staff should be looking at the creativity. The amount of resource, that's a manager's job. So there it, there it is. That's, those were the recommended measures from the ITSM. Nothing up there. So there was no common measure. You can see all the measures were functional. So how on earth could we collaborate if we've all got a different purpose and we have different measures? It's idiotic. And then we don't meet these measures, so we try harder. We try harder and we create more waste, we create more overburden, and we get behind, there's more backlog, and then we prioritize. And then we get more work because we prioritize and now other customers are chasing us. There's this downward spiral, because the measurement system is nonsensical. Is this difficult to understand? It seems to be for senior managers. Why? Because there's a fixation on resource and control here. This is all about value. All about value. Perfecting the work making sure that errors were out, and things like that. And I'm going to make a paper available on these four things for you to see. But getting the measurement system sorted out is really important, getting the purpose sorted out, and then visualizing, the getting the measurement systems, the data, and then cleaning up the work. Developing the workforce, I will leave you with this. A3, there's lots of stuff that goes around about A3. Most of it is mythology. A3 does not improve anything. A3 is about improving you. The biggest barrier to improving anything is you and your mental monsters, your assumptions. And the A3 is there to surface the reality of what's going on. If you do an A3 on your own, it takes two or more to A3. It's a communications device, it's a collaboration. The type of questions we ask are these. So when a manager delegates, we teach people now, when a manager delegates a piece of work, the staff ask the manager these questions. They're A3 questions. So what are we, why are we talking about this? What's the purpose? Why is it a problem? When did this occur? All looking for the facts. So when that happened, what did you make it mean? It's amazing, we make it mean all sorts of things. All right? So A3 is an incredible discipline. A3 is not about continuous improvement. It is about continuous self-improvement. It's about overcoming how you see the world. And it's usually done with your coach, so it's done in private. Your coach, when he's doing A3, is not there as a cheerleader. He is there to pick apart your logic, how you're seeing that, before you go out and talk to other people. That's what the A3 is about. It's a very powerful technique. But people use the boxes and go off 
they sometimes fill out all the boxes because they, what they've got is a solution and they want to implement the solution. Say, so, well, why, why, what problem are you trying to solve with that solution? We spend more time making sure we have the right problem and the data supports it before we move to the countermeasures. And when we move to countermeasures, we need at least three alternatives. Why? Because the first one's usually the easiest, the least elegant, and the cheapest, and the biggest quick fix, which leads to long-term problems. Quick fixes leads to, leads to long-term losses. So these are the questions. The teams and the organizations that I work with take this, and they put it up next to their phone. So anybody coming through, they clarify. You know, so what evidence do you have? Well, what evidence do you need? So how you can find out? What outcomes are you seeking? They've put it by their phone. Very, very simple. Don't just take something when it's delegated. Ask questions, because you can guarantee the manager hasn't asked those questions when it was given to him. But he expects you to fix it. Now, it seems if I'm having a really good go at managers, I'm not. They're just as trapped. But you can help make them successful. And in doing that, makes you successful. Agile and lean is about investing in yourself. And you're a leader as of now. Thank you very much. Okay. Yep. I think we have like time for one question. We can if, have questions. I'm here all day. We can have questions later. Yep, sure. Uh, if you if you'd like to have one, so anybody. Let me come down there so I can see you. Thank you. Actually, What's your name, I, first uh, of all? My name is Anton. Anton, yes. okay. Uh, I want to ask you, as I understand, uh, the idea of uh, having a similar climate is uh, to have the basis with the same values. Like, everybody sees the values uh, in the same way or have the same values. Have you, right. do you know how to reach it? Uh, so yes. everybody in your company have... It's, it's, because a, it's a good question. It's, it's not about having the same values. The, the value, uh, for instance, I might value entrepreneurialism. Other people might value being uh, much more methodical. All right? That's not the type of thing. What we're talking about here are, are the mechanisms that allow us to collaborate and work together. So that I have slightly different values that I'm entrepreneurial, you're a bit less risk-taking, but between us, if we are sharing the right information and the organization is pointing us in the right direction with the right measures, we can figure it out. All right? So I'm, I don't want it to be confused to the value set that is usually published. Uh, I'm, t I'm really talking about the purpose and having the mechanisms so that you feel comfortable to contribute. And when you do contribute and fail, you're not beaten up. So they may be the values. You could, you, you could devise a value set from that. But that's not its purpose, but it could be used to do that. I know that's a, probably an unsatisfactory answer, but it's, it's a messy answer like most reality is. Okay. We can talk more on that, yes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, I'm around all day.